All right, I'd like if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 10. And although I would love to read the entire chapter, it's 48 verses long, so I think it might, might be expedient not to. I'm going to read the first nine verses of this very, very important chapter. In fact, it's so important that it's almost repeated uh, in, in essence in chapter 11 as well. So we can see this is a very significant chapter in the Word of God. So chapter 10, verses 1 through 9, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent unto Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us this morning. I want to give you a kind of a brief outline of chapter 10. And in verses 1 through 9, what we read, we see the prepared heart. We see that God had already been working in the heart of this Gentile man called Cornelius. And then from verse 10 through 23, God is going to prepare the preacher to take the message to this man with a prepared heart. And sometimes God has to work at both ends of the equation. He works in the heart of the, the one who needs the gospel, and he also works in the heart of the one who is supposed to bring the gospel. And we see that in this instance. And then from verse 24 through 48 is the proclamation of the gospel. Peter uh, preaching uh, to Cornelius and his entire household. So it's just a really delightful chapter. And as we've been going through Acts, we've noticed uh, that it's a book of transition and change. And we keep emphasizing that because it's the only way you can really understand Acts, that it's a book of change. Uh, really, as you read the Gospels, it's all centered in Jerusalem and it's all about Jews. And, and so uh, when you get to the epistles, it's all Gentiles for the most part. And so how do we get from here to here? Well, the book of Acts tells you how we got from this very Jewish emphasis gospels to this Gentile orientated church. And it's because of the events that took place in these transitional chapters in the book of Acts. Changes from the old to the new covenant, from law to grace, uh, from the gospel uh, going from Jerusalem to the very ends of the earth. And that's what we find in the book of Acts. So in Acts 1 through 7, it was all Jewish ground. We were in Jerusalem. We were in Judea. Uh, everybody that's in the church in the first seven chapters, every person in the church is Jewish. No Gentile converts at all. And then in chapter 8, there's a, a big step forward. Gen, uh, not Gentiles, but Samaritans are reached with the gospel through the ministry of Philip. And Samaritans were kind of half breed they were half jews and gentiles they weren't fully jews they weren't fully gentiles they were kind of half breeds and so it was a step forward because they, their jews generally hated the samaritans there was no love lost between them if you remember two of the apostles wanted to call down fire from heaven to to zap them burn them up you know that's what they thought of them so so this was a major step forward because part of those that were reaching out to them uh, you know, would have would have been men like this that, that once wanted a fire to be sent from God against them. Well, if, if that was bad enough, in Acts 9, you have the conversion of the apostle to the Gentiles. So it's getting us ready for the next big step. And the next big step is bringing the gospel to 
the Gentile world. And that's why we should enjoy this chapter, because it's telling how did the gospel reach people like us, right? Uh, how did it reach out to, to these Gentile dogs, as they were called? Yeah, and that wasn't meant to be pedigrees in any way. Uh, that mutts is the idea, that that's how Jews viewed the Gentiles. And so we say if there was animosity between Jews and Samaritans, it was even worse between Jews and Gentiles. In fact, if a Jew had been visiting a Gentile nation, when he came back to the land of Israel, his first action was to shake the dust off his feet because he'd been in defiling territory. And you can see it even in the Gospels in John 18. Uh, the, if you remember uh, when the Lord Jesus was on trial, it says in verse 28 of J John 18, then led they Jesus from Caiaphas to the hall of judgment. And it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And so they wouldn't even go to Pilate's judgment hall, even though it was in Israel, but it was Gentile territory, you see. This is where uh, Roman government was, was exercised. And so they felt if we even stand there, we're defiled, you see. That, so you can see how difficult it is uh, to, to get uh, the gospel to these people who were viewed in that negative light. And of course, it's confirmed in this chapter. If you look at chapter 10 of Acts and verse 28, you, you'll notice it says, uh, he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And then again in chapter 11 and verse 3, uh, the accusation is being made from Jerusalem for Peter. It says, saying, thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. You know, what a crime. You actually ate with uncircumcised men. And so you can see how difficult this is. This is a very difficult thing. And part of the reason it's a difficult thing is because of diet. <clears throat> it was hard to eat with a Jew to eat with a Gentile because the Jews had unique dietary laws. And so, of course, he went to a Gentile. It just wasn't kosher to eat at their table. Right, because they, they ate things like pork and other unclean things, and, and so it made it very difficult. And so that was a really the central issue that was the difficulty. How are we going to reach these people if we can't even sit down and eat with them? Right, because often it's in that comfortable environment of round the table that you can share something like the gospel. And if you can't even sit and meet with them, then how are you going to how are you going to reach them? And so this is why chapter 10 is so important, because there's a vision given to Peter in hit the preparation of him. And, and it's this net coming down from heaven. And we'll talk about it in more detail. But in it is all kinds of animals and not the kosher kind. Right. So just imagine, use your imagination. What's in there? There's there's pigs. There's definitely shrimp. There's lobster. There's all kinds of things that they were not allowed to eat. And Peter is given the rice, kill and eat. And so God is showing that he's going to he's taken away these Jewish dietary laws because he wants the gospel to reach out to these non-Jewish people. Now, why were these Jews uh, given their dietary laws in the first place? A lot of people think it was just about health. Now, uh, I want to suggest to you that maybe if you followed the Jewish dietary laws, maybe there would be some health benefits. Uh, we, we do know, for instance, uh, especially without refrigeration, uh, that, that pigs are they kind of they're dirty creatures and they eat anything, right? And, and so a lot of disease could be spread, tapeworm, or, I'm not going to go into all the graphic details, but, but you can get pretty sick if you, if you eat a pig that's not being preserved properly. And so it, the Jews would not have that issue. They're only eating things that are considered to be clean. So there, so there are certain maybe health benefits at this time for them, but that was not the reason. The reason was God wanted them to be separated from the nations. He wanted them to be a separated people. And there's reasons for that. I want you to look at a couple of scriptures just to show why God wanted them to be a separated people. The fact that he did want that. One is Numbers 23. Numbers chapter 23. And this is 
verse 9, and it's one of the prophecies of Balaam, and it says in verse 9, it says, from the top of the rocks I see him, speaking of Israel, and from the hills I behold him, lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. So they're meant to dwell alone. They're meant to be isolated from the rest of the nations. God wanted them to be separate. And there's a, there's a definite reason for that. Look at Exodus 19. Again, just to emphasize that they were to be a separated people. Exodus 19 and verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19 verse, verse 5 and 6, where it says this. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant... Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And so they were meant to be a unique people. They were meant to be a light to the nations, but, but not through necessarily their great evangelistic labors, but because they were meant to stand out as different because they were following God's laws and they, they were meant to just, in a sense, shout loudly like a megaphone to the rest of the world. Look, this is what happens to a nation that obeys and follows the Lord. And the idea was that Gentiles were to be attracted to that and want to come to that. You get examples of that in the word of God where that is indeed is true. Now, why were they to be so separated from the nations? Well, part of the reason they were to be separated from the nations was the nations largely were idolatrous and evil. And so you've got, for instance, in Leviticus 18, you've got a description of what the land of Canaan and the nations in Canaan were like. And it includes things like incest, homosexuality, uh, and witchcraft, and, and we could just, I mean, it's a horrible list. It's a bit like living in contemporary America, all of those things and more, right? And, and it is hard, right? Isn't it hard to live in this, even in our contemporary culture, when, when the degradation and evil is everywhere? And, and, it, and it, it's hard not to be influenced by it. Uh, the media is full of it. I mean, uh, you know, and so there's an agenda and, and it's hard to be separate. It's hard to be different. And so for Israel, God made it easier for them to be different because it made it hard for them to eat with others and therefore not to be influenced by them. So <clears throat> there was a peer pressure from the nations and God was trying to protect them. So positively, it reinforced in Israel's thinking that as a nation, they were separated to the Lord and they were intended to be different. God wanted them to know that they were a peculiar people unto him. By the way, in like ways, we're meant to be different too. Not because we, we have a different diet, uh, but we should have a different manner of life to the nations to those that surround us. We're, we're meant to be different. We're meant to be a peculiar people. And then negatively, the laws had an immediate practical effect. Uh, they made social mixing with Gentiles difficult uh, and uh, it made it very hard for the, for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. But one of the negative sides that it had on the nation of Israel is that they developed a superiority complex. They thought they were better than all the nations. But the problem is the book of Deuteronomy told them that when God picked them, it wasn't because they were better than anybody, right? Uh, it, it was just out of his grace that he chose them. And, and so it wasn't to do that they were any better. And so they had this, this kind of superiority complex, uh, which was a direct result of their separation <clears throat> to God. It also led to confusion in their thinking between genuine holiness and ceremonial holiness. So they felt like as long as they ate the right food, in some ways, it didn't really matter how you lived, as long as you ate the right food, as long as you wore the right outfit. And but isn't that easy for us to be like that? You know, in other words, if you give people a code, they'll follow it and, and they feel like they're different. But inside, their hearts can be absolutely wicked. And, and so I want to just to show you this, how uh, that was a real problem. And the Lord highlighted it. Uh, look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, just to see how the Lord highlighted this issue uh, with the nation of Israel. Luke 11, verse 39. <clears throat> he says to them, 
And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. And so externally, they were keeping the rules, like they did the ceremonial washings, they had the right diet and all the rest of it. But the law said to them, you know, you got all that right, but there's something really wrong here. And the problem is, it's an internal issue inside you're absolutely wicked. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the danger, isn't it? That, uh, and for all of us, that we can, we can focus on externalism and yet the heart be somewhere else, right? And the Lord is interested in the heart. And, and that's, the, that's really important for us. But they, they had this uh, idea that a bad Jew was better than a good Gentile. I mean, that was the kind of, that was their mentality. We're God's special people. And so, you know, <clears throat> as long as we're doing the right things, everything's fine. But the Lord brought change. And of course, the Lord is the great change bringer. He's always bringing change. And we see a marvelous change, Matthew, uh, Mark's gospel, sorry, chapter seven. I believe the Lord was ahead of, of everyone else in, in teaching this radical change. And so in Mark's gospel, chapter seven, verse 15, he teaches and he says, there's nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, they are those that defile the man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever things uh, from without enter into a man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For well, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now, how radical, how different, right? Jews are focusing on what they put in, and the Lord is saying, that's not where the problem is. It's not what you're eating. <laughs> it's what's coming out of you is the issue. Uh, the, the, the evil that's in your heart is being manifested in your conduct and your ways, and that is what is defiling you. And the disciples were slow to accept this. And again, they've been raised on this, this mindset, you see. And so how are they ever going to get the gospel to the Gentiles? And that brings us to our chapter, chapter 10. But before we, we get to uh, the Lord preparing Peter, we want to observe some things about what he was doing beforehand to prepare this man called Cornelius. And again, there's so many practical things in this particular chapter. And, and I, I would just say this just before we dive into it as well, that actually this um, Cornelius gets more treatment in Acts than any other incident in terms of amount of text devoted to it, than any other incident other than the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Okay, so, so you can see, you know, Saul's testimony is three times in Acts. But here you've got chapter 10, Cornelius is dealt with chapter 11, Cornelius is dealt with chapter 15, it will come up again, Cornelius, you see. So this is, this is a big, important thing that Luke wants to uh, make sure we understand how significant this chapter is. So Cornelius was a, a centurion, uh, a man in Caesarea called Cornelius, centurion of the band called the Italian band. And remember we said that the gospel began with Shem, and then it went to Ham, the Ethiopian eunuch, and now it's going to Japheth. So it's going out, uh, again, reaching uh, the various uh, groupings in the human race. So is this centurion? Now, it tells us that there was something unusual about this centurion. Wasn't your typical, wasn't your typical uh, centurion uh, who, like many of them, uh, were given over to the gods of Rome and pagan, but this man's different. He's a devout man, it says, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. 
And, and so he, he's a devout man, a God-fearer, uh, and um, a man who's giving generously and praying to God always. So he's, he's really a different type of centurion, although we do meet one or two of them along the way in the Gospels like this. But he, he, he's a different man. And, and it tells us uh, that God had taken note of this. The Jews had taken note of this. He was obviously well-liked amongst the Jews, uh, but he also, uh, God had taken note of this because it tells us, in verse 4, it says, when he looked on him, this angel that had come to him, he was afraid. What is it, Lord? He said to him, thy prayers and thy arms are come up for a memorial before God. And that raises an interesting question. Because we know for sure that in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is not a saved man. How do we know that? Look at chapter 11. And verse 14, speaking of Peter, it says, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Okay, so clearly Cornelius and his household, religious as they were, were unsaved religious people. They needed to hear words whereby they might be saved. And so, of course, it raises this interesting question. Does God hear the prayers of the unsaved because clearly it god tells us his prayers have come up as a memorial before god and yet he's not a saved man and so i would say dogmatically does god hear the prayers of the unsaved yes and no how's that for dogmatism <laughs> see does god hear the prayers of his children i would say exactly the same yes and no See, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, right? Whether I'm saved or unsaved, right? In other words, if I'm somebody that's actively engaged in willful sin, even if I'm a believer, I might pray, but it's, not, it's just going to bounce off the roof. It's not going to reach heaven at all because I'm not in the right condition, you see? And so <clears throat> I do believe that the, this, the sincere prayers of an unsaved individual like Cornelius, who's sincerely seeking after God. And obviously, there are people that seek after God. He's, he's seeking God. He's doing everything he can to follow the light that he has, and God hears his prayer. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And so I think it's good to say that, that yes, God does sometimes hear. the. In other words, if God didn't hear the, prayer, the sincere prayers of the unsaved, how did you get saved? Was there a point in your life where you said, Lord, save me? And as you began that prayer, you weren't saved. By the time you finished that prayer, you got saved, right? But, but God heard. Are you glad God heard that prayer? Amen. I'm really thankful he heard my prayer when I said, Lord, save me. I'm really thankful. And, and so <laughs> certainly... Uh, we, we can see that God saw this man and the angel is sent to him. Now, here's another interesting thing. God sent the angel to tell him to send for Peter. Now, this we could have saved an awful lot of verses if the angel had simply told him the gospel. Right? Would, I mean, it would have shortcut the whole thing. I mean, our Bible would be a little bit thinner. Right? But angels have not been given the great commission we have and only the recipients of grace can give the message of grace to others and so peter himself has received grace he's going to be the individual who's going to deliver the message of grace i might just say this just uh, by way of practical application and that is, I think it would be a very good thing if we prayed that the Lord would lead us to men like Cornelius or women like Lydia, it says, who the Lord's heart would, uh, had opened, right? She was a prepared person, right? And so I think it would be good, Lord, there are people out there. There are people in Springfield, Missouri, I believe, who are sincerely seeking after God. And we need to say, Lord, lead me to such people, right? Lead me to people who are 
are really hungry for truth. They know that all is not well right now on planet Earth, and they're they're, they're looking for answers. And the Lord lead me, and, and I think I told you before, but we, I was so impressed by this passage many years ago. Uh, we were back on a short furlough in Isle, uh, from Ireland, and I, I was going around giving mission reports, and I asked people to pray the Lord would lead us to a Cornelius. And I meant a kind of guy like this, but when we first got back to Ireland, the first evangelistic study we had, a friend brought along another friend and so i introduced myself and he said i asked him what his name was and he said oh my name is cornelius O'Shea." Uh, uh, he was a cornelius uh, 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 <laughs> and and so i was meaning in a general sense i mean just give me a guy who's got a heart like but the lord gave us a cornelius who really was it and what a wonderful man that turned out to be a real sincere a brother if ever you were preaching you'd be the first one to come up afterwards and thank you for the message and ask some question or whatever it just was a gem of a guy it still is a gem of a guy from what i understand uh, but um anyway just praise the lord for that and, and so i think it'd be good for us to pray there are needy souls out there lord lead us to such people who you've been working in that we might give them the words whereby they might be saved so now we come to the preparation of the messenger in verse 9 it says on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour so they make the journey from caesarea to joppa uh, and uh, <clears throat> of course that's where peter is staying in joppa now it's kind of interesting that joppa is where jonah went if you remember, and he, he went to get away from taking the message to Gentiles. He, did, he didn't want to go to Nineveh, and so he got on a ship and went to Tarshish, if you remember the story. And, and so now he is Simon, son of Jonah. Isn't that interesting? Back at Jopper, and is he going to be reluctant, or is he going to be willing to take the message to Gentiles? And of course, praise God, he was willing. But I just find it interesting that Joppa was really, actually Dan uh, is the tribe of Dan, that territory is where Joppa was. They were meant to be the missionary tribe and they failed to drive out the people and they ended up going way up to the northern border and they missed out their opportunity of being the missionary tribe, taking the message from Israel out to the world. They missed that opportunity. But Peter is in Joppa and uh, he has uh, about to receive this message, but God has to prepare him for it. And so it, it says he went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So he's hungry. It's kind of interesting. God's going to use his natural state of hunger. And he's going to when you're hungry, sometimes you ever dream about food when you're hungry. Well, he's going to have an afternoon nap and he's going to be dreaming about food. Uh, but God has a bigger message that he wants to get to him. And, and so here he is. And um, it says that he was praying. He went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So it's kind of interesting. We, we have a, a praying seeker and a praying servant, right? Cornelius was praying. His prayers were heard. And now Peter is praying. And God is going to bring together the praying seeker and the praying servant. And we're going to have a dynamic interaction in this chapter. And so God is, God is working at both ends of the equation, both preparing the recipient and preparing the messenger. And again, this is God. God, God is working. Uh, I want you to know that God is working in our world today. And no doubt about it. He's working. I mean, it might not seem that way, but he's at work. And he's working in people's lives. You know how I know that? Years ago in Ireland, they did a lot of door-to-door -door work. And you go to a door, and it was pretty systematic. We would go cover an area, and then we'd go back again after we'd done the community. We'd go back again. And you go to a door, and somebody would, would just want nothing to do with you. I mean, just rail on, on you, kick you out. And then you go back the next time, maybe a couple of years have passed, knock on the same door. And the person's all ears. They want to listen. Now, what happened? Well, God has been working in their lives since that rejection. And he's been bringing things into their circumstance. And all of a sudden, they've got ears to hear. They're not no longer uh, hard-hearted. And so uh, God is working. 
And so he's bringing these two together. And so it tells us in verse 10, he became very hungry, would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending onto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. And some suggest, and I think from the word it's possible that this great sheet might have been a sail. I mean, they're at a they're at a seaport. They're at the seaport for taking in, in the, the missionary kind of uh, gateway uh, of Israel. And so there's this 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 sail, uh, and in it is all these various creatures. And it says, wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and heat, eat. Because that, that's uh, the hunter's favorite verse, isn't it? Rise, kill and eat. People, hunters love that verse. Rise, kill and eat. But notice that <clears throat> Peter's response, Peter said, not so, Lord. <laughs> Can you see a difficulty with that? Like if he's Lord, you don't say not so to him. Right? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And yet here's Peter saying, not so, Lord. And again, yeah, Peter was a very Jewish man. And so he's thinking, I can't eat those things, Lord. I've never eaten anything like that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good kosher boy. You know, I've never done any of those things. And that's the way, he's, even though he's hungry, you know, he's, he's, he's hungry. He tells us that, but he says, I can't eat those things, Lord. And so he, here we get the key statement, really, of the whole chapter. The voice spake to him, verse 15, again, the second time. Remember that the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time? <laughs> Do you remember that? The word comes to Peter the second time. And this is what God says. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And so immediately... The Jewish dietary laws are done away with. Isn't that marvelous? Aren't you thankful for that? <laughs> Imagine if to become a Christian, you had to become a Jew first. Like if you're a Gentile and you had to get circumcised and you had to keep the law. There are some that would preach that, right? Seventh-day Adventists, basically, you've got to be, behave like a Jew in their minds, if you want to be following the Lord. Aren't you glad you don't have to do all those things? <clears throat> he says, what I've cleansed. Don't you dare, Peter, call it common or unclean. <clears throat> and so it says, this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. It's interesting how... Seems like Peter needs things three times. He denied the Lord three times. Peter says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Three times. And now this vision appears three times, right? And sometimes some of us are slow learners. We, we need things repeated, repeated, repeated before it finally dawns on us. The Lord wants us to do this. And so <clears throat> Peter um, is told three times, given this vision three times, it says the vessel is received up to heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Now, I want you just to notice something here. It was an angel that came and spoke to Cornelius <coughs> and told him, you go and send Simon Peter. But for Peter, it was the spirit of God that spoke to him, right? Because he's a child of God, indwelt by the spirit of God. And the spirit of God said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So even though it was an angel, but it was the Spirit of God was working through this delegated angel 
to get these men to come to Peter, I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent <clears throat> unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said to Cornelius, uh, said Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee to his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. So again, there's a big step forward here, right? If, if you can go and eat with Gentiles, having Gentiles stay with you was a bit dubious as well. So obviously there's a, there's a, a softening of attitudes here. He, he puts them up, he lodges them with them. And, and then it says, <clears throat> uh, and on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. We're learning chapter 11. There were six of them. He took six Jews with him. And he's going to be really glad he took them with because they, they're going to witness this event. And it's going to be necessary when trouble comes down from Jerusalem. Uh, you've been eating with Gentiles to have six eyewitnesses that were there and saw the event. who are going to stand with Peter. And so it's very important that this is true, that he took these with him to be eyewitnesses. And so it says in verse 24, the morrow uh, after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. So what we're going to find here is the first evangelistic cottage meeting in scripture. Don't you just love this? This is, this is uh, and you, you see this, uh, you know, kind of the home is a great place for the gospel to go forth. Uh, we had some friends in England, and they, they were both doctors, but they had a big home. But boy, they would open their home. They'd have all kinds of events in their home, carols by candlelight, different things. And the gospel went forth from their home. It was a, they were constantly having unbelievers in so they could hear the gospel. She would have evangelistic coffee mornings, all kinds of things. It was really amazing. So this is the first instance of that. And so imagine Cornelius has invited all his relatives and near friends. So it's not just Peter's going to be speaking to the one individual. He's got a whole family now to, to speak the gospel to. And it says, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, verse 25, and worshipped him. Now, here's an interesting thing. Because you can tell that Cornelius is sincere, but he's clearly, he clearly needs help, right? I mean, he's worshipping Peter. He falls down and worships him. And notice Peter's response. Oh, and if only the so-called successors of Peter, the popes and pontiffs and all these other guys that love to have their rings kissed and their feet kissed and all this kind of stuff, if only they'd learn from Peter, it might be a different story. Because it says, notice what Peter says, Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. <laughs> In other words, don't worship me. I'm just a man. It's interesting that um, there is a statue of St. Peter in Rome. And um, it's, uh, it's traditional that you kiss it. You kiss the feet. And apparently, it has been so kissed over the centuries that the big toe has been kissed off. <laughs> it's not there anymore. Isn't that interesting? How sad that this system claiming to be representative as the true church and yet not paying attention to the simple text of scripture get up i'm just a man and uh sadly this man uh <clears throat> who has a billion souls duped into believing a false gospel Oh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes on the day of judgment. I really wouldn't. What a sobering thought it is. So Peter <coughs> is, tells him, stand up, I am also a man. And as he taught with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common 
call on clean. So Peter makes the leap now between dietary laws and the fact that no person should be looked down on, considered to be common or unclean. And so we see a tremendous leap in Peter's understanding. He sees the, the full significance of the vision, that it goes beyond mere dietary laws, and it shows that God is no respecter of persons, but uh, the, he has a heart to reach all mankind. And so it tells us um, that as uh, this news uh, is dawns on Peter's mind, it says, therefore came I unto you, verse 29, without gainsaying or opposing, contradicting, as soon as I was sent for, I ask therefore for what intent you have sent for me. And Cornelius in, uh, uh, said four days ago, and he explains what had happened. I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't you love an opportunity like that? Can you imagine being invited to somebody's house and it's full of unbelievers and they're all waiting to hear what you might tell them and they want to know everything that has been commanded by God? I mean, uh, I mean, wow. I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, it would be like sick them to us, wouldn't it? I mean, we have been, what a glorious opportunity that would be. The God. Give us those kind of opportunities. Lord, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had those kind of opportunities where we had a house full of people and they just want to know what God has to say? Let's pray for that. Let's pray at our prayer meeting for that. Lord, open doors. You're the God who opens doors. Open doors, open hearts so that we might preach this message to others. And so <clears throat> Peter says in verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. He's not a respecter. So it doesn't matter what a background the person's from, whether Jewish or Gentile, whether black or white, uh, it, it, male or female, vaxxed or unvaxxed, it doesn't matter. As far as the gospel is concerned, it's available to everyone. God has no respect for persons. And, and what a wonderful thing it is to have a God that is no respect for persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That's not saying that, that Peter is not telling us that as long as you work righteousness and all the rest of it, you're going to be saved. It's not a gospel of works. He's, he's going to tell us next. He needed to hear words whereby he must be saved. But what he's telling us is that people who are sincerely seeking after God, God is willing to receive them by faith in his son. Those that are looking out for the truth, seeking after the truth. And, and so here's a man that, that does this. And he's, he's genuinely seeking the truth and God is going to accept him based on the gospel. And so it tells us that Peter, uh, it says, the word which God sent, verse 36, to the children of Israel, and here's, here's a beautiful message. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now, our time has come to an end, but it's a good place to end this morning. Because if ever our world was lacking peace, it's now. And I'm not just talking about on an international level. Troubled hearts, suicides, are through the roof, all over, it's and young people. People are desperately lacking peace. And the Bible tells us, there's no peace, save my God, for the wicked. But it does tell us that there is a way that a man can have peace. Peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says, preaching peace through 
Jesus or by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And if a person is troubled, if they're troubled this morning, uh, and they're, they're just concerned and burdened about all that's going the, the only place you'll find peace is in the person of the Lord Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. And he's the only one who can bring peace. Peace with God, first of all, through the cross. Uh, it, 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 he made peace through the blood of his cross. It's only by dying on the cross that it's possible for man, who's at enmity with God, to enjoy peace with God. It's through the cross. And so individual personal peace with God, it's only possible through the cross of the Lord Jesus. But even peace with one another, it's only if Jesus Christ is Lord that we'll enjoy peace amongst each other. If I'm trying to assert my will, not his will, it's going to cause disruption. Right? It's all, it, it, he is the ultimate peacemaker. And so Peter's message is to preach peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And he's going to unfold that message and develop that message, but we will have to wait until June before we hear that message. Uh, but I think you can read the rest of the story. If you can't wait till June, just read the rest of the chapter, and it will explain the message that Peter gave. But from our perspective, I think the practical lesson of this, and it's a very important one, is that God tells me that the fields are white and ready to harvest. That's what God says. And so that would tell me that there are a lot of Corneliuses out there. They're just ready to be harvested. But they need to hear words by which they might be saved. And so God has to prepare them, and he is doing that, but he also has to prepare us to be willing to take that message to their homes, to where they are. And sometimes it almost seems that the difficulty is not with him preparing the unsaved. The difficulty seems to be getting him to prepare us to be willing messengers. And we've talked about this been an issue we've talked about our lack of evangelistic passion we need to ask the lord lord work yes work in them but work in us make us and if it means having a dream i don't know i mean we've got the scriptures we don't need a dream we've got it right here but but lord whatever it takes get us ready to be ready to share this message the lost men and women Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word, the practicality of it. Lord, we're thankful for Peter that unlike uh, Jonah, he didn't go the wrong direction, but he did after that encouragement go where you wanted him to be. And he took that message, not just to Cornelius, but the entire household. And Lord, we pray for this. We pray that we might see entire households, one to the Savior. You're the God of open doors. We're asking for open doors. Lord, we're, we're dull. Uh, sometimes maybe you've even shown us them in the past and we didn't see them because of our own dullness. Lord, we, we pray that we might see the doors that you're opening and have the courage to go through them and to deliver this message that alone can bring peace to troubled souls. And we'll give thee the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.